I'm Irene Villa, I'm uh, from uh, uh, University of Trento, and today we will talk about functional encryption. Uh, this seminar will be uh, really an introduction, so we're not going to go into details, but it's like an overview of functional encryption. We'll so give some introduction, uh, we'll talk about some security notions and uh, some mathematical assumptions related to functional encryption. And tomorrow with Carla Mascia, you will see kind of a continuation of this talk. Okay, so go, go really uh, fast in this introduction part because, okay, classical cryptography is divided into symmetric cryptography and public key cryptography. Public key, we all know that there are uh, two um, keys, a public key used for uh, encryption and a private or secret one used for decryption. Uh, public key cryptography is uh, used in many different um, applications, but okay, I want to stress uh, two aspects of uh, public key cryptography. The first one is that it's a kind of, um, uh, it's, we can say that it's a, a all or nothing um, um, type of uh, encryption and decryption in the sense that either we possess the uh, correct uh, uh, secret key and we are able to decrypt and see and read and see and clear the entire message or we don't learn anything uh, on the encrypted message so in this sense it's all or nothing and the other aspects i want to stress here is um, that is uh, characterized by a coarse grain access control in the sense that uh, for every encryption, so for every um, encryption done with a public key, uh, so for every public key used for the encryption, there is only one uh, um, private key used for decryption. So um, in this sense, uh, it's a coarse grain access control. And in many emerging application, uh, public key, uh, cryptography is not the best uh, solution we can uh, we can use. For example, imagine that we are exchanging uh, e uh, encrypted emails, but then we would like to have a sort of a, a filter that is able to to filter uh, the emails that are spam. But if the emails are encrypted, this is uh, difficult to to perform. Or we have uh, uh, we want to express um, more uh, complex um, access control. Uh, uh, to give uh, uh, to be to give access to different people. So with the uh, public key encryption, this is difficult to perform. Um, or also uh, mining large data sets. So we have a um, data set of encrypted data. We want to operate on this uh, um, on this data, um, but using public key encryption, this is um, difficult. So we have to decrypt all the data, modify the data, and encrypt them again. Um, in this sense, functional encryption kind of was, uh, at least the idea of functional encryption comes from um, this, from the fact of trying to uh, improve somehow uh, public key encryption and to give, um, um, to, to allow to perform more uh, um, complex uh, action on uh, uh, encrypted data. So functional encryption was introduced in 2005 by Sai and Waters, and later on in 2010, it was uh, formalized by Bonne, Sai and Waters. And functional encryption uh, uh, was born with uh, mainly two goals. The first one is to allow a fine grain access control of encrypted data. And the second one that it allows to learn only a specific function of encrypted data. So this in, in uh, position with what I mentioned before about public encryption that it was uh, all or nothing. So now it's not more all or nothing, but you can also learn only a function, not all the message, but only a function of the message. And then the coarse grain access control for public encryption. Now we want to have a fine grain access control of um, encrypted data. Okay, so let's start with the definition. Uh, first of all, in order to define a scheme, we have to define a functionality. The word a functionality is a function f defined over two sets, k and x. k is the key space, so this uh, set containing all the um, different keys, and x is this plaintext space, so a set containing the plaintext. 
And this is a function that takes an input, a pair, a key, and a plain text, and um, gives an output, uh, a proper output, or um, this symbol. And with this symbol, we denote the failure of the algorithm. Then we say that also in the key space, there is a special key um, called the empty key. And usually it's denoted with this uh, epsilon. And we have that this functionality um, somehow describes the functions of a plain text that can be learned from the ciphertext. So uh, somehow we can, uh, so we take an input, a, a key k and a plain text x, and then functionality can be seen as a function uh, of the plain text. Okay, so given a functionality f, we define the functional encryption scheme for this functionality. And the scheme is characterized by four uh, algorithms. The first one is the setup. So we need to do the setup of the system. So we take an input a security parameter lambda and we generate, um, we generate uh, two different key, a public key and a master secret key. Then we have the uh, key generation algorithm. Now we take an input the master secret key and uh, a key k uh, belonging to the uh, key space. And we give in output a secret key, or um, sometimes I will call it a uh, um, decryption key that uh, depends on this uh, key uh, k. Then we have the encryption that is usually takes an input the public key and a plain text x belonging to the plain text space and gives in output a cipher text. And then the decryption. The decryption takes a cipher text, take um, a secret key or a decryption key uh, um, that depends on the, um, a key k and uh, gives an output y. And we have that the scheme is correct if this output y correspond actually to the functionality f evaluated in k and x. This with the probability one or with um, let's say high probability. So this is the, the algorithm that um, are involved in a functional encryption scheme. And to uh, try to understand better um, how this works, uh, let's see uh, this, um, this simple scheme. So usually when we describe a functional encryption scheme, we have a special user so a user that has some special um, capabilities and usually uh, this user is called an authority. So the authority uh, takes an input a security parameter and does the setup of the system. So there is a public key and the master secret key. For example, we can put the public key on the cloud so everyone is able to encrypt a message. And then we have two users, uh, Alice and Bob. Uh, the authority uh, generate a key starting from a key from the key space uh, k. So it generates this uh, decryption key uh, that depends on uh, k and gives this key to Bob. And then there is Alice that she encrypts a message x using the public key and send the message, uh, this encryption, this ciphertext to Bob. And now Bob is able to decrypt the ciphertext and he will not learn the entire uh, plain text x but it will learn he will learn a function of this plain text so he will be able to get the functionality f evaluated in k and x okay let's consider another scenario in which again there is the authority uh, that has performed the setup so public key is already on the cloud there is alice bob and then imagine there is also bill now the authority uh, decide that uh, associate to Bob uh, the key in, of, from the key space K1 and to build um, the key K2. So perform the, so generates the keys corresponding to these two um, different keys. So we have uh, um, the decryption key depending on K1 and the decryption key depending on K2. And this one to Bob and the other one to Bill. Now Alice says before she wants to share a message so she encrypts this plain text X and uh, put this uh, ciphertext on the cloud. So everyone has access to this uh, encryption, to this ciphertext. But then if Bob tried to decrypt it, he will learn 
uh, the functionality f evaluated in k1 and x. Instead, if Bill uh, decrypt this uh, ciphertext, he will learn the functionality f evaluated in k2x. So given the same plain text, they will be able to learn two different um, functions of this plain text. OK, so this is the overview of uh, um, standard uh, functional encryption scheme. And uh, we um, give an example now of, um, OK, we show now that actually uh, this, the classical or standard public cryptography is an example of a functional encryption scheme. Indeed, assume that we consider um, a key space uh, that has only two uh, keys. We have a key for, that we indicate with, uh, with the note with one and the empty key. And then we define the functionality f as follows. So if the key is equal to one, that the functionality uh, gives uh, the actual plain text. Instead, if the key is the empty key, it just gives the, the bit length of the plain text. And using this functionality, we are basically describing um, the action of a public key uh, crypto system. So if the key is the correct one, and the correct one is the one generated starting from uh, k equal to one, we are able to decrypt the message. Instead, if the key is an uh, empty one, we don't really get anything. We don't really get anything because the, the role of the empty key is Mm, basically to give us information that we already have. For example, assume that the, the when we encrypt a message, the, the length of the ciphertext is the same length as the plain text, then this output, so knowing the, the, the length of the, the plain text is something that we already uh, knew because we uh, had access to the, the ciphertext. Okay, so we have that uh, standard public cryptography is an example of functional encryption. And actually, I will not give, I will not go into details about this. I think you will see a bit tomorrow, but also what we, you have seen in the past um, lecture. So um, attribute-based encryption and uh, identity-based encryption, they can also uh, be seen as um, family, subfamilies of the family of functional encryption schemes. Um, okay. Um, okay, so we have defined uh, the basic uh, uh, algorithms for a functional encryption scheme. So let's talk now about security. Um, so in order to for a functional encryption, uh, encryption scheme to be secure, basically the main goal that we want to achieve is that we want to prevent collusion attacks. These attacks basically um, uh, so basically what we want is that if two uh, um, attacker uh, possess two different um, decryption key, we don't want that even if they collude, they collaborate, they are able to get more information about a plain text uh, than uh, what they already uh, know. So let's try to, um, uh, to explain this better using an example. As I said before, uh, Attribute-based encryption is, um, um, is, can be seen as a functional encryption scheme. So we use attribute-based encryption, in particular in this case is, uh, uh, yeah, ciphertext policy attribute-based encryption uh, to describe an example. So to, in order to talk about collusion attacks. So imagine that we have um, a plain text X and we want, or we have a message, and we want uh, to um, encrypt this message, and we want the only per only users that are able to decrypt it are users that either no that are that have the following attributes. So they must be over thirty years old, and also they must be Italian citizens. So this is the policy we embed in the in the plain text. So we encrypt this uh, plain text. And then there are two users, uh, Mario that uh, is uh, under 20 and is Italian. And on the other side, we have Luigi that instead is over 30 and is from uh, uh, San Marino. So in order to uh, 
prevent collusion attacks, we want that even if Mario and Luigi, they collaborated, so they collude, they, they combine their secret keys, they should not be able to read the encrypted message. So even if Mario is Italian and Luigi is over 30, they should not be able to um, uh, read the message we encrypted. So this is the idea of um, security for a functional encryption scheme. And um, so in order to describe like more formally this idea, there are different uh, notions. We will present two of them here uh, briefly. The first one is the indistinguishability-based security notion. And for this uh, notion, uh, we introduce a game that depends on a random bit B. And uh, we have an, um, an adversary that is playing this game. And the game is as follows. So first, we run the setup of the system and we give the public key to the adversary. Second, there is the um, first phase of uh, query. Basically, the adversary can uh, adaptively submit different queries for different keys belonging to the key space of its choice. So it selects K1 and uh, send this to, to, let's say, to us, and we uh, give to the adversary the secret key corresponding to K1. And then it selects K2 and we do the same. So once he's satisfied, so he has uh, received all the keys he wanted, there is the, the challenge phase. In this phase, the adversary um, select two messages belonging to the plain text space, M0 and M1. But these two messages must satisfy the following uh, restrictions. So, uh, basically, so the functionality F on uh, the all different keys that the, the adversary has selected before, evaluated on M0 and evaluated on M1, they must uh, coincide. So, basically, uh, given um, the side, uh, oh. So basically, he should not be able to distinguish these two messages uh, using the keys he, he got in the first uh, phase of query. So uh, he selects two messages that satisfy this requirement. And then in output, we give to the adversary the encryption of the message M bits, where B was the bit, um, the random bit selected at the beginning of the game. And then there is another phase of query basically is identical to the previous one, but now uh, the, the keys that the adversary selects must um, satisfy this um, restriction. So once uh, the adversary uh, is satisfied, so he has enough um, secret keys for the keys that he wanted, uh, there is the guess space. Now the adversary um, eventually outputs a bit B prime. Try and this bit uh, with this bit is trying to guess if the message he received was M0 or M1. So the adversary wins the game if the bit B prime actually is the bit of the game. So this is the, the, the game the adversary is playing. And we say that uh, the scheme is indistinguishability based secure if the probability that the adversary is able to win the game. So this probability has to be close to one half. So basically, um, has to be the same probability of a random guess. So the fact that uh, um, the adversary is able to uh, distinguish the if, if uh, the message, the encrypted message was M0 and M1 is basically the same as if just picked a random between uh, M0 and M1. Uh, so this is um, the notion of distinguishability-based security. But then we have that sometimes this notion is not strong enough. And we show now an example in which uh, you can see that uh, we, sometimes we need something stronger. Okay, imagine the following. We have um, uh, a key space with uh, T uh, keys, K1, Kt. And for each of these keys, we associate a permutation map, a permutation of the plaintext space. 
sigma one, sigma t. And then we um, consider the following functionality f that given an input a, a key ki and a plain text x, it uh, gives in output the permutation of the plain text using the map sigma i. And then we uh, build the following uh, um, functional encryption scheme. So basically, the encryption of the message is um, a trivial and a bit stupid encryption because we directly give the, the message in the clear. So the encryption of X is X. And instead, the, the encryption of X using the secret key, uh, depending on, uh, in this case, on uh, the key KI, is the output of the functionality. So is uh, the map sigma i applied to the plain text x. So clearly, using this scheme, we are leaking more information about the plain text than needed. So it, only by the description of this, one can say, OK, this scheme is definitely not secure. But then if we apply the definition of uh, indistinguishability-based secure that we just see, we can see that this, uh, we can show that this, um, uh, this scheme is actually indistinguishability-based secure. Why? Because we have a restriction, when the adversary um, select the two messages that uh, it wants to be challenged upon, so M0 and M1, we had the restriction in which the functionality on the uh, the functionality on these two messages must coincide. So it means that uh, for every, key ki that the adversary has um, required the, the secret key, the message m0 and the message m1 must coincide when uh, we apply the, the permutation sigma i. So it means that m0 must, must be equal to m1. So then distinguish m0 from m1 is just basically a random guess. So with this scheme, we see that in some specific situation, uh, the notion of indistinguishability-based secure is not strong enough. And for this reason was introduced another notion, that's, that's the simulation-based security. Uh, basically, uh, we, um, we say that a scheme is called simulation-based secure if the view of an adversary can be simulated by a simulator where we give to the simulator only access to the functions um, evaluated on the corresponding messages. So let's try to describe this a bit um, uh, a bit better. So basically, we have uh, an adversary as before. And we give to the, this adversary the public key as before. Uh, also, a set of secret keys, um, SK1, SKL, corresponding to key from the key space K1 and KL of its choice. So as before, the adversary selects um, perform some queries on different keys from the key space, and we give in, in return uh, the corresponding uh, secret keys. And then we give to the adversary a cipher text. And then given this information, we assume that the adversary is able to, to learn something about the plain text X. But then we assume that there is an also another uh, algorithm that um, we call the simulator. And to this other e algorithm, uh, to the simulator, we only give the um, public key pk, and then we would directly give the functionality f evaluated on the different keys um, that uh, were given were to, uh, were selected from by the adversary, uh, and the plain text x. And then, if given only this information, the the simulator is able to output the same information about x that uh, the adversary was able to output. Then we say that the um, this scheme is a simulation-based security. So everything that the adversary is able to know was already uh, known um, by the simulator. But then this notion is seems stronger than the indistinguish indistinguishability-based security, and in some uh, in some cases actually it is. But then it was proven that in some specific situation, uh, it's impossible to achieve this simulation-based security. Anyway, it's important also to know this other uh, notion. OK, uh, to conclude, 
you have seen it also yesterday when uh, Ricardo was uh, talking about this um, key policy uh, attribute-based encryption scheme, in which it showed that the scheme was uh, proven secure under a certain assumption. So the security of a scheme uh, depends on the hardness of solving a certain mathematical problem, so on a, some assumption. And in um, functional encryption scheme, maybe the, the assumptions that are involved are different problems based on bilinear groups, so on pairings. Uh, uh, there are also schemes that um, involve the, the LWE problem and other scheme that involves other problems like quadratic residuosity, multivariate quadratic polynomial problems, and so on and so forth. So I will just, uh, in the following slide, uh, briefly uh, talk about the, these problems. You have seen them already, so uh, especially uh, problems on pairings, you have um, seen them also yesterday. So briefly, we have a pairing E, that's a, so a bilinear map. One of the known uh, or problem uh, involving um, group is the decisional Diffie-Hellman problem, which we are given uh, three elements, um, G, G to the A, G to the B, and then a fourth one. And we have to uh, decide if the, if the first one is of the form G to the A times B, or is a random element of uh, the group G1. But if um, there exists an admissible bilinear map, then this problem is easy to solve because this relation is satisfied. So the pairing of G to the A and G to the B correspond to the pairing of uh, G to the A times B in G. So if we substitute here, instead of G to the A times B, the fourth element we are given, we can verify uh, whether this uh, relation is uh, still satisfied. So we know if the element was the form G to the A times B or not. So for this reason, uh, other uh, problems were introduced. For example, the decisional bilinear Diffie-Hellman problem, that's one that Ricardo was uh, mentioning uh, yesterday, or we have also the another one that I mentioned just to, add some, uh, yeah, just to add another one, is the decisional linear problem. In this case, we are given this uh, long tuple, uh, G, G to the A, G to the B, G to the A times C, G to the B times D. And if we are talking about an, um, an asymmetric pairing, so with G1 and G2 different, we are also given H, H to the A and H to the B. So given all this information, we are given then an extra element and we have to decide whether this extra element of the form G to the C plus D or it's a random element uh, uh, of the group. Okay, these are some uh, problem related to pairings. And the other family of problem is the problem of the learning with error. Again, I think you have seen them already in some previous um, uh, lectures. So basically we are given an integer uh, Q a uh, narrow distribution key. And we are asked to distinguish between uh, uh, two pair of distribution. From one side, we have A and A times S plus X. And on the other side, we have A and U, where A is a matrix, S is a vector, and X, S also U is a vector, and X is a vector that depends on this uh, error distribution. And then I also mentioned other assumptions. So for example, we have the uh, multivariate quadratic polynomial problem. Basically, this problem consists in solving systems of multivariate quadratic equation over fine fields. Uh, another problem used is the quadratic residuosity problem. We are given two integers, a and n, and we have to decide whether a is a quadratic residue module n or not, where a quadratic uh, residue is an element of the form b to the square uh, mod n. And then we have also the Paillet decisional composite residuosity problem. Again, we are given uh, uh, two integers, a and n, where n is the product of two prime, and a is in um, z and square. And we have to decide whether a is of the form b to the n mod n square or not. So these are some of the problems involved in uh, different uh, functional encryption schemes. Uh, these are some uh, reference. Uh, with some um, 
uh, introduction, yeah, you can have like an introduction of functional encryption scheme. And that's the end of my talk. So if you have questions, go for it. <laughs>